The COVID-19 pandemic has had a telling effect on global economies. Governments recorded dramatic drops in projected growth. Millions lost their jobs and the most vulnerable lost their lives. The Caribbean has been hard hit as governments closed borders, mobilized health services and urged their publics to undertake new ways of living and working for their health sake. The private sector has been hardest hit, particularly small to medium enterprises with bankruptcies, closures and a drastic reduction in activities. The number of the unemployed is swollen forcing governments to top up those who lost wages and to shore up businesses. The IMF, World Bank, IDB and the Caribbean Development Bank have all provided financing. As the region reopens to international travel and welcomes tourists, restoration of economies to pre-COVID times is top of mind. We launched the 2020 series of the Caribbean Economic Forum produced by the Central Bank of Barbados with the topic COVID and economic policy, protecting jobs, businesses and the economy. Our host is Cleveston Haynes, the governor of the Central Bank of Barbados in Bridgetown. The current chairman of the Central Bankers of the Caribbean is Dr. Gobin Ganga of the Bank of Guyana in Georgetown. The central banker overseeing the monetary interests of eight countries is Timothy Antoine, the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank in Bastyrs and Kitts. And our fourth central banker is Richard Biles, governor of the Bank of Jamaica in Kingston. Our discussion is intended to give our Caribbean audience an appreciation of the role of the central banks in this economic recovery. It is an opportunity to interact with the governors through the many channels we will share. I'm Julian Rogers in Kingston, welcoming all to the 2020 series of the Caribbean Economic Forum. And a very good evening wherever you are across this Caribbean or beyond the Caribbean, following this first edition of what we call the virtual edition of the Caribbean Economic Forum. Yes, I'm in Kingston, Jamaica, and uh, the panel this evening sitting in Bastyrs and Kitts, in Bridgetown, Barbados, in Georgetown, Diana, and of course, uh, Governor uh, Richard Biles is in Kingston, where I am as well. So a special welcome to all of you. And I'm going to start first by engaging with the governor of the OECF, the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, so to speak, uh, Timothy. Uh, and I, I think it's important to give all of you actually an opportunity to give our audience a sense of where our countries were when we realized the first impact of COVID. So, uh, Timothy Antoine in Basque I want you first to respond to that question. Where were your states at that point, say in March? So, thank you very much, Julian. Let me say good evening to all of our viewers and listeners in the Caribbean and around the world. I do wish to also thank Governor Haynes and his team at the Central Bank of Barbados for arranging this regional conversation. Uh, to your question, where was the ECCU at the outset of prior to the outset or onset of the pandemic? Well, the ECCU was actually projecting to go by 3.5% before the pandemic. Since then, and up now, our latest projection is that we will contract the ECCU will contract by between 10 and 20% this year alone. So you can see the dramatic change in the economic fortunes of our currency union as a result of the pandemic. But of course, Julian, you would appreciate that this impact is not unique to the ECCU. In fact, the world is facing its worst economic crisis in almost 100 years. Uh, we're told that the global economy this year will contract by at least 5% based on the IMF estimates as of yesterday. And we know the impact has been great on large and small economies. Uh, the U.S. is going to contract by 8%, the U.K. by 10%. Africa, for the first time in 25 years, will actually contract. And, and of course, all countries in the, in the CARICOM area, with the exception of Guyana, will contract this year. We're all in recession. So um, that is the starting point. That is where that is where we are at the moment. All right. I'll ask the same question of uh, as you talk about Diana. Uh, let's go to uh, the governor uh, Ganga in uh, Georgetown. I, I have to say that uh, many of us looked on with certain envy over the recent years to the kind of growth that uh, Diana was enjoying, and then the prospect of oil and so on really boosting that further. But Kobe came along and hit you as well. So tell us what happened then back in March. 
Uh, indeed, Julian. Um, as you know, our economic fundamentals were very, very favorable uh, prior to COVID. Our growth rate with oil was about 87% projected. Uh, Non-oil growth would have been just over 5% or about there. Um, our inflation rate uh, would have been very, very low single digit. Um, we would have had an increase in reserves as we were projecting. Our exchange rate would have remained and we expect that to remain relatively stable. However, after COVID or with the impact of COVID, obviously with respect to global demand declining from growth, uh, we would have seen a significant decline in economic activities. With oil, um, after COVID, we would have projected 57% uh, growth in GDP, which would have been a significant decline from where we were projecting to be uh, prior to COVID. In non-oil growth, we are now looking at negative uh, 5 to 7%. It could even be more if this is prolonged because major sectors um, would have been hit, such as the services sector, transport, communication, education, administration, uh, likewise wholesale and retail. Um, like manufacturing would have also been affected. So would have been um, agriculture, some sectors, I mean, some subsectors. So what we would have seen would have been coming out from a, a very glorious outlook where we were the star of the region and even in the world to one where we are now just like any ordinary country being impacted by this pandemic. So, so, so Julian, Having said that, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is gone. Uh, we are still um, looking forward for some stability and growth and development as we move forward. Well, I, I have to take issue with you because when you, when you say that Guyana is a scar, um, I think you give me a, a, a good lead in here for, for Jamaica because uh, certainly last, uh, last year there were the stars in terms of both thing about getting through a, a very stringent homegrown, so to speak, uh, IMF program. And uh, and then Governor Biles, who was not even in the chair for a year as yet, had to contend not only uh, with, 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 with a new job, but a, a whole new perspective. So Governor Biles, by March, uh, you didn't expect anything like this. None of us expected that. So where, where was Jamaica at that point? Yes, uh, we, for the last seven years, we had uh, been on a track of uh, a very strong economic reform program. Um, and we had made good headway. Uh, our debt to GDP had been reduced from 145 to 92. Uh, we had built our reserves from just a little under a billion to over 3.6 billion. We had got unemployment down to about 7.2%. And we had made major reforms in the financial sector uh, and the banks were strong uh, and doing very well, good capitalization. Uh, so it was, COVID came and interrupted that process um, and has set us back. But we feel that if we pick up from where we left off, uh, we will be able to achieve maybe a little later than we had hoped but we will achieve exactly what we wanted, which is macrofinancial stability, uh, low inflation, uh, and economic growth. Uh, we had projected growth of about 1.1% before COVID, uh, and that has now been reversed. We expect to we expect about minus 4 to minus 7%, somewhere in there, um, uh, hopefully closer to the minus 4 than the minus 7 uh, so we uh, remain hopeful. We uh, have begun the process of, of reopening the economy. Uh, and so uh, let's see what we can do. All right. Well, let's see. We will talk a lot more about that, about the kinds of measures that uh, you've in, all have implemented. Well, let me go to Barbados and to our host, uh, the governor of the Central Bank there, Cleveston Haynes. Uh, certainly. Again, I, I must remark that many of us looked at the Barbados situation over recent years and said, what happened to Barbados? And if that happened to Barbados, hey, we'll be tied, be, be tied up, so to speak. But you were in the chair uh, for quite some time. You've been there for, I don't know, 30 years at the, at the Central Bank. Uh, so you've, you, you, you've seen all the changes over time, but not a change like this. So where was Barbados then? Thank you, Julian. 
And like my colleagues, we were significantly impacted uh, by this COVID crisis. As, as everyone knows, Barbados went through a period of sort of economic paralysis where our reserves were falling, and there was sluggish economic activity, and our debt was beginning to explode. And so over the last two years, we worked very diligently to restore the situation to the point where our reserves have been rebuilt to comfortable levels. Uh, we've had some debt restructuring, which has brought our, our debt levels down. And the only thing that we really wanted to do now was to get the economy to grow. We anticipated for 2020 that we'd be able to get some modest growth uh, backed by investment uh, from foreign investors. But when COVID came, that basically uh, threw all of our plans uh, askew. Uh, over the past year, we were able to get a primary surplus on our fiscal of 6% of GDP. And we've had to cut that back to an estimate right now of 1% of, of GDP. And, and, and being able to achieve that 1% will really depend on how strong we're able to maintain uh, economic activity uh, going forward. So rather than getting modest economic growth, we now expect to have a di double digit fall in, in output for 2020. And as you've seen, as everybody has seen, that has resulted in significant loss in jobs, uh, loss in revenue for government. And one thing that really has stood out uh, for us is that our reserves held steady. Not only have we been able to get uh, resources from the AMF, but we've not really had to sell for an exchange in order to show our reserves over the past three months. And that, I think, is a, a positive sign in terms of the developments that we've had. All right, so there's, 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 a, there's the framework. There's the, 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 the so-called uh, canvas upon which we will work this evening. And I will go back to uh, Timothy in uh, Bastyrs and Kits and talk about the work of the ECCU. You've got uh, so many territories to look after the interest. Uh, you succeeded over uh, several decades now to maintain uh, a par rate to the US dollar of 270, et cetera. Where's the pressure and what are the measures that you've had to implement so far to keep some kind of stability in the market? So just to be clear, um, Julian and uh, viewers, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, uh, one of our principal tasks is to maintain a strong EC dollar. And we do that by maintaining strong foreign reserves to back the EC dollar. So the law says the backing must be at least 60% uh, with foreign reserves. At the moment, we're almost at 100%. And, um, and so we've come into the pandemic in a strong position in respect of our foreign reserves. Import cover, foreign reserves, uh, and generally, we believe that we are in a good position to weather this difficult season. Um, so, so far, the, the currency continues to perform very well. Um, there's very little change, frankly, between the start of the pandemic and, and now. Uh, but you ask, what have we been doing? So, specifically, at the outset of the pandemic, the central bank provided a grant of $4 million uh, to our member countries, um, half a million each, to assist them with critical supplies, equipment and supplies. Because the first rule in fighting a pandemic, the first rule in pandemic economics is to control the pandemic. And truth be told, as a region, we have controlled this pandemic at least at this, up to this point. Yes, a great sacrifice, to be, to be clear, but we have controlled the pandemic. Um, so that in several countries, including at least half of the ECCU, there are now no active cases of COVID-19. In addition to that, the central bank, our central bank has worked with the commercial banks to support a loan deferral program of up to six months. The credit unions are doing a similar thing, I think for about three months. Uh, we've lowered the discount rate, which is the rate at which we lend to banks and governments. Uh, to 2%. Before that, it was 65 And for the first time in 17 years, we lowered that rate, uh, the discount rate. And so at this moment, we stand ready as a central bank to provide liquidity to our commercial banks as needed. Uh, at this stage, they have not requested that support, partly because or principally because they have entered the pandemic well capitalized. But of course, we anticipate that this will be a long, difficult season. And so we stand ready to provide liquidity support as needed. There are other measures, but this is a sample of some of the things that we've done so far. All right. Let me ask the same question of, uh, of Dr. Ganga in Georgetown, Guyana. What have you put in place so far? 
thanks, Julian. There are a number of fiscal monetary policies that we would have been implemented uh, to, to combat the adverse impacts of um, COVID-19. On the fiscal front, we would have had uh, removal of VAT on uh, utility. Um, we would have also um, removed VAT on domestic um, air travel. Uh, we would have been paying pension earlier. We would have, we would have also been um, removing excise duties on sanitized products. So essentially what was happening was that we were trying to provide more disposable income to everyone to ensure that there is a basic, um, I would say, indirect transfer. So one would be able to do the necessary adjustment for welfare improvement. With respect to firms, as I said, there were also some deferral and there were some removal of excise on a temporary basis. They also had deferral in terms of tax payment. On the monetary perspective, and as you know, if you don't have an enabled environment in the financial system, you're not going to continue with growth and development because that will also be putting additional pressure on, on fiscal, uh, government fiscal uh, um, stance. Essentially, what we would have done would have also provided a moratorium of uh, six months for um, credit facility in terms of repayment of loans, uh, especially for those um, firms and even individuals uh, who would have been affected by, by COVID. In addition to that, we continue with respect to a very, very uh, accommodative monetary policy to ensure that there is enough liquidity in the system so that whoever would want to borrow would be able to borrow. But at the same time, we ensure that inflation is being checked. I could tell you now that our inflation rate is below 1%. So there is sufficient room for us to continue our monetary policy. Our exchange rate remains relatively stable. We would have projected an increase in reserves. However, because of the impact on both oil and non oil um, prices um, for some of our commodities, uh, we weren't able to do that significantly, but we would have that room as we go ahead. But the bottom line is that what we would have provided from the central bank side would have been that confidence, that confidence in our economy from the financial perspective in that we have a sound banking system we have a situation where the economic fundamentals remain very favorable for growth and development so that we can encourage investors to come in. Households can also have this confidence going forward that their real disposable income remain intact. Thanks, Julian. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before I ask uh, the, the next governor to respond to this similar question, I just want to remind you that this is the Caribbean Economic Forum. It's uh, coming across the entire Caribbean on television and online and beyond the Caribbean for that matter. I'm Julian Rogers in Kingston, Jamaica. Timothy Antoine is in Bastias and Kitts at the Eastern Caribbean uh, Currency Union headquarters there. Uh, we've also got uh, Dr. Ganga in Georgetown, Guyana. He's at the Bank of Guyana. Uh, Richard Biles is at the Bank of Jamaica. And Cleveson Haynes, who is our host, governor this evening, He's in Bridgetown, Barbados. Let me go to uh, to Kingston, or stay in Kingston for that matter, where I am, and talk to Governor Biles about the measures which the central bank has uh, put in place in response to the COVID uh, situation. Thank you, Julian. On March 21st, when we uh, had to close all borders, um, it had a ripple effect in the financial markets, um, stock exchange started a fall that eventually ended up at about 30% of its value. Uh, and the bond market also went into a fall. And so many mutual funds uh, found themselves uh, and corporations with uh, um, securities on their books that were valued a whole lot less and quite illiquid. Uh, so the Bank of Jamaica had to step in and provide both Jamaican dollar liquidity as well as US dollar liquidity. On the Jamaican dollar side, we lowered our cash reserves uh, by 2%, uh, right down to the statutory minimum of, of 5%. And we embarked on a bond buying program uh, where we bought back bonds, Jamaican dollar, Jamaica government bonds as well as Bank of Jamaica bonds. 
from the financial sector, not just the banks, but from the security dealers too. That put uh, approximately, uh, let's call it 350 million US, the equivalent of, in, of liquidity into the system. Uh, and today I can say that uh, to make a dollar liquidity in the financial sector is very stable and very sufficient. And we don't have any concerns uh, about that. On the US dollar side, uh, the closure of our borders meant that approximately 2 billion US dollars a year uh, was cut off from the economy. Now that's a very big number. Uh, and so the foreign exchange market uh, reacted to it uh, rationally. And we had to step in and we had to use different methods in order to uh, keep the market rational. Uh, uh, we reduced the cash reserves on US dollar deposits also by 2%, uh, and that put a lot of liquidity into the market. We uh, entered into swaps with the commercial banks where we provided US dollars, they provided J dollars to us, and then we would swap it back later on. We entered into a program of repurchase of uh, US dollar bonds that they held, uh, bonds issued by Jamaican government or Bank of Jamaica. Um, and also we sold foreign currency into the market. Of course, um, we also, um, uh, in conjunction with the IMF, um, access the RFI uh, for 520 million also. Uh, so all in all, we uh, put ourselves in a position where there was more than sufficient liquidity in the foreign exchange market. Uh, over the period, I think we probably have provided about 400 million US dollars of liquidity in, in the market. Uh, and those are the major uh, um, steps that the central bank had to take to uh, make sure that Jamaican dollar and US liquidity was at sufficient levels. Governor Haynes, you, you referred earlier to the protection of the Barbados dollar, etc. I give you a chance now to spell out some of the critical measures that you put in place in response to, to COVID. Great, so in, in terms of the, the dollar in Barbados, obviously the, the big buffer for that is our international reserves. And as I pointed out earlier, uh, we were going through a period of building our reserves. And since the COVID, has, the onset of COVID, we've been able to get resources, both from the IDB and excess resources from the IMF, which has taken our reserves close to 2 billion Barbados dollars, which is sort of unprecedented in terms of the level of reserves that we have. So we feel very comfortable with the stock of reserves and, and the support that we have done in terms of monetary policy uh, is a lot similar to what uh, Governor Antoine mentioned in the, in the context of the OECS, in the sense that we went into this in a situation where the interest rate environment was quite low and the banks were flush with liquidity. And what we did was basically lower the discount rate uh, from 7% to 2%. We reduced our securities ratio for banks. We limited it for our smaller part three entities to ensure that if they had any liquidity challenges, that they would be able to get access to that liquidity. Today, none of them has had to come to us uh, for liquidity support because, as I said, the, the liquidity in the system is, is quite high. We complemented that with our discussions with commercial banks such that they provided moratoria to the private sector for their loans because we recognize that both individuals and corporates will be affected uh, by the loss of economic activity and the loss of jobs, and that has gone relatively smoothly so far. And then, of course, we've supported the government in terms of restructuring how we approach the, the overall macroeconomic policy. As I mentioned earlier, we reduced the primary balance uh, from 6% to 1% as our target for this year. And, and what the government has been doing is on the one hand, increasing its expenditure on health in order to address the challenges of the pandemic, but also trying to provide support as a social safety net uh, to the private sector, both in terms of individuals, the unemployment insurance, severance, uh, welfare payments, as well as make it available to the private sector of back loan fund to provide cash flow uh, in these difficult times. And of course, 
uh, we also encourage the banks with like working capital uh, toward the corporates who may need it to help them get through what is clearly a very difficult challenge for us. Gentlemen, I want to I want to spend the next five minutes very quickly. And I'll go around the, the table, so to speak. Uh, it's now three months. We down to the end of uh, June now. Uh, is it too early to talk about the impact of the measures you've taken in place? Um, can you can you go? Can I go around and, and ask for for a sounding here? Let me let me start in Bastyr's and Kids. Has it changed the mood? That, uh, have people responded positively from the business sector? Uh, I know that you, you, you're a technical expert, but at the same time, I know that you do you must feel uh, the atmosphere on the ground. So you would appreciate that uh, most of our economies, not just in the ECCO, but around the Caribbean, are tourism-dependent economies. And so to a large extent, the recovery of the regional economy, uh, the recovery of the ECCU, is tied to the recovery of tourism. At this moment, tourism is shut. So the impact that we're seeing in terms of jobs, the impact that we see in terms of revenues in several of our government's countries, our revenues have plummeted to less than 50%, or at least they've fallen by 50% of what they were pre-COVID. Those impacts are real and continuing. And until and unless tourism reopens, those impacts will continue. And so because we, our borders are still closed, most countries, and because tourism is likely to have a protracted recovery, um, we are still at the very early stages, in my estimation, of this uh, situation. And so we are now internally in our countries relaxing, reopening local businesses and so on. But, so that helps. So in that sense, economic activity has picked up in the last month. But in terms of the macroeconomy, nothing uh, fundamentally or dramatically will change uh, until we're able to get tourism um, resuscitated or re recovered. And, and that is really the, the major challenge, I think, that we all face at this time. And that is why there is this significant discussion going on about what are the protocols around which we will reopen our economies uh, to tourism, reopen our borders for tourism. That's where we are and in the MCCU. All right. So you, you, you focus on tourism as the, as the savior, so to speak. Uh, and that, I think, is at the heart of the recovery effort here in Jamaica. So let me give uh, Richard Biles an opportunity to set the stage for us. Yes, well, I think what Timothy said is true of Jamaica, uh, perhaps to a lesser extent than it is true for the Eastern Caribbean, because we are not as tourism dependent, but nonetheless, it is a very major contributor to our foreign exchange earnings and to our employment. So it's true of us also. Uh, we opened our borders just recently and we are hopeful that we can manage the process uh, of starting, restarting tourism. Um, some hotels are open and others are scheduled and have announced that they will open next month. Of course, a lot depends on the countries from which uh, tourists are coming, that in those countries, the infection rate uh, remains low or gets low and stays low. Uh, and that the protocol of uh, uh, involved in tourists coming back home uh, is sufficiently simple that it doesn't uh, stop people from wanting to take a vacation uh, outside of the borders of their country. Uh, so it, to a large extent, our recovery is intertwined with the good management of the spread of the pandemic in, in uh, countries like the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, and, and, and Europe in general. All right, so I think that's a, an excellent opportunity for us to take a break here. But let me remind you, this is the Caribbean Economic Forum, and it's uh, sponsored by the Central Bank of Barbados, and we have with us in an historic gathering four governors of the region, Timothy Antoine of the ECCU, which, of course, is the grouping with the Organization of, of, of Eastern Caribbean States. We have our Barbados uh, our Governor, uh, Cleveson Haynes, in Guyana. There's Dr. Gabinda Ganga, who is the governor of the Bank of, uh, of Guyana, and uh, also Richard Biles, who you just heard from. We'll take a break, but we'll come back with the reaction from our audience who have been following us on social media.
No one is immune to mental illness. Your age, race, gender, social class, or economic status is no match for addictive behaviors, anxiety, or eating disorders, depression, or schizophrenia. What is, is having a good social support system. As the saying goes, in times of test, family is best. Unfortunately, many are denied the benefit of the support of family and friends because of stigma and an oppressive silence around mental illness. Let's put an end to the silence. Speak up. Speak now. End the stigma. Share your story. End the stigma. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. In order to reduce the stigma and discrimination of persons who have COVID-19, here is what you need to know. Anyone can contract COVID-19. COVID-19 is not a death sentence. The job of healthcare workers is invaluable. To a COVID-19 survivors, there is life after COVID-19. Anyone can be affected by COVID-19. For children or parents with children, it is okay to be anxious. Kindly contact the Mental Health Helpline of the Ministry of Health and Wellness at 888-NEW-LIFE for support. That's 888-639-5433. For at-risk groups, such as persons with HIV and AIDS, do not be afraid to disclose your pre-existing condition to your healthcare provider or health clinic. Manage your condition and follow preventative methods. Maintain a healthy lifestyle, get adequate sleep, eat healthy, stay physically active. For health workers, recognize the early signs of stress, increased irritability, disturbed sleep, displaced anger, lack of concentration, or poor eating habits. Don't just know them. Do something about them. Tourism doesn't exist by itself. Tourism happens only because a whole range of other economic activities are taking place. Having tourism is to ensure that there can be growth in almost every economic sector the small craft vendors and the small foodies on the street corner who make some of the most delicious. At the end of the year and every month we will have a, another focus on another set of guests. So the next one is reviving the tourism sector, which was, of course was at the heart of our discussion before we went to the break. As usual, we got an audience uh, and that audience is online and therefore we want to turn our attention to them. We've got a, a moderator who has been looking and tracking that online activity, and he is Elihu Wahid. He's in Bridgetown, Barbados. Good evening, welcome, my friend. Good night, Julian. Uh, good night to the governors as well, and good night to the audience all across the Caribbean region. Um, tonight is historic in the fact that it gives ordinary people like myself the opportunity to interact with the governors on their perspectives and their plans on limiting the effect of COVID-19 economy. Um, there are a couple of themes which are, are coming through on social media. And so this first question would go to Governor Ganga as the incoming um, chairman of the regional group you know, of central bank governors. Uh, one question is, how can we work more, work more closely together region to help limit the impact of COVID-19? All right, uh, we seem to have an, an audio problem there, but uh, we're gonna make another attempt, of course, to get the answer uh, from uh, the governor of the Bank of uh, Guyana. Uh, let's see, um, you heard the question, governor? Yes, yes, I do. Well, I, go right I, was ahead. Oh, I just wanna give thanks to the person who asked that question. And I just want to remind our audience 
is that CARICOM is the oldest is one of the oldest customs union in the world. Now, this custom union was set up largely because of the tremendous benefits as that we can have by just having this custom union, this regional integrate, integration that was required so that we can all improve um, welfare. The bottom line is that a regional approach is very, very important because it provides for a more efficient and effective way to address the challenges of COVID-19 or any of our problems or challenges that we may face. Um, the bottom line is that, look, it doesn't only give us a larger voice, but it gives us this, this kind of situation where we are a single market and an economy, meaning there is no border. So in terms of, 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 of all the externalities, positive externalities, we can all be able to enjoy those positive externalities. So we are not only going to improve national welfare, we are improving general welfare, that is, of the region. So we improve our own welfare, we improve the, the, the regional welfare. So it's like double dipping into benefits from the regional integration that we have. So what we have to, to, to do is to deal with issue in a very coordinated, concerted, and a wholesome manner. And by doing that, we save a lot of energy and cost. Bottom line, as I said, is that CARICOM was set up uh, to, provide, to provide the kind of benefits in terms of a larger market, in terms of um, we are able not to go back and reinvent the wheel. We are able to allow for migration. We allow for our people to grow and develop. We allow for very decent, sustainable jobs for our people. All of this, as a matter of fact, I will tell you, almost all IFIs, they want to deal with the region, not individual countries, because they know the benefits that we can have by being a part of this CARICOM region. And therefore, as the incoming chair of CARICOM, we, as CARICOM governors, have been sharing international best practices that are relevant to us. We don't have to go back and reinvent the wheel. And we know okay. that we have a kind of brotherhood in the, in the region, which we can all utilize for our own benefit and also for the region's benefit. Thank you, Julia. Thank, thank you very much, sir. I think, I think well said. Uh, and we look forward, of course, to your tenure as the chairman of the Central Bankers of the Caribbean. Thank you very much, uh, Elihu, as well, uh, for posing a question on behalf of our online uh, viewers and listeners. And let me assure you that you can continue uh, to submit your questions, etc., and we'll certainly share them with the governors as we go along. This is the Caribbean Economic Forum, and let me uh, return to the to the governors. Uh, and I was asking uh, the, the question about uh, about measures and impact, etc. I didn't give an opportunity to Governor Haynes to to to, to, to comment on that uh, because I, I talked about the mood uh, in these various countries as they see the various measures implemented, and we're now at the end of uh, end of June. But uh, before we do that, let me just go to the Hoba online and uh, get a, an email question which is coming in, which I think is very important that we share right now, and. Uh, Given the significant reduction in government revenues forecasted, are you concerned about regional sovereign debt defaults or restructures? Uh, who is going to be brave enough to build that gap? Governor Hint? <laughs> well, Barbara has just gone through uh, a debt restructuring of its own. Uh, 2018, the domestic one, and 2019, we completed the the national one. So we, we know that when you get into very serious financial difficulty, that that is an option which uh, you don't like to utilize. Uh, clearly, if you, you pay borrow money, you want to be able to honor your commitments to repay it on a timely basis. And therefore, uh, that restructuring, I think, is something that one should use only in very exceptional circumstances. And I think in our case, we thought that the circumstances warranted it. 
Uh, clearly, uh, from a regional perspective, all of the countries will face uh, challenges because of the, of the loss of revenue. And whether or not one adopts a, a strategy of restructuring debt will ultimately depend on the buffers which you, which you have. Uh, some countries have stronger buffers, as I pointed out uh, earlier. In, in our own case, we've been able, because of the permanent balances that we have uh, incurred, services that we've incurred uh, over the past two years, we've been able to build up deposits which enable us to continue to make payments uh, for our public services. But some countries may face challenges. I, I can't really speak to how it will evolve in individual uh, countries. Uh, decisions will have to be made uh, both in terms of services of debt or the delivery of the goods and services uh, which you're able to provide. Because what this crisis has done is that it has caused us to refocus on the goods and services which we provide as, as governments. And depending on the nature of the revenue loss and depending on the type of services which are provided, then the decision will have to be made as to whether or not um, restructuring is a viable op option in the respective uh, territories. I'll ask Ricky Balser to weigh in here uh, because the matter of, of debt services is, is very critical. Yes, uh, several of the countries, have, you, you've been able to, to get support from the IMF and, and the World Bank, etc. But uh, what are the concerns that you want to share with the, with the Caribbean audience and particularly the Jamaican audience in regard to debt servicing? Well, the question had to do with sovereign debt, so let's start there. Uh, yeah. Sovereign debt has to be serviced from uh, foreign exchange reserves. Uh, in Jamaica, we have reserves, gross reserves of about 3.9 billion. So to the extent that the economic uh, uh, situation doesn't last for years and years, we certainly should have enough reserves to deal with all of our debt obligations. Uh, um, on the local debt side, I don't think there is an issue there. The government has built up a good buffer of cash reserves uh, and the tax has not fallen off to the extent that we feel endangered in any way that we won't be able to pay um, debt. Uh, in fact, the tax numbers are turning out to be better than forecasted. Uh, so we are very, we feel pretty confident uh, in that respect. Uh, Governor Antoine, you you have any anxieties at all? Well, I think the the, the primary and immediate need of our governments is liquidity, um, cash, to be able to to manage their obligations to the to the citizens, um, provide basic services, and to take care of, of course, all the COVID-19 related expenditure. So here you have a situation where the revenues have plummeted, in some cases by as much as 50%. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, COVID-19 expenditures ha have grown exponentially. What our region, and certainly the ECCU, would, would wish is to see a debt stand still on the longer-term debt. So I make a distinction between short-term debt, treasury bills, um, through, for example, the regional government securities market. We continue to operate that market in a normal way. Um, we are rolling over continuing to make issues, uh, issuances. And, and in fact, up to uh, earlier this week, I believe it was, or last week, we had a, earlier this week actually, an oversubscription on the regional government securities market. But we have said before the pandemic and again in this pandemic, that we need a, situ we need a facility such that when there is a shock on our economies, as we have now, that there is a dead standstill so what we would like for longer term debt is a debt standstill of two years to allow our countries time to recover before resuming debt servicing. We have fought for this because we believe that all small states should have what we call disaster-linked clauses, uh, otherwise called hurricane clauses. Uh, they can be for any disaster, such that if you have a shock of a certain magnitude, there is a standstill that is agreed up front between the issuer and the investor. So there is no issue of default. If a situation arises where there's a need, it triggers, the standstill triggers, and you know for a period of time, one year, two years, you do not service, and then you resume. That is the work we've been doing with the International Capital Market Association 
uh, the IMF and the World Bank for the last several years, the Paris Club. And uh, we have got them to agree to a term sheet. What we need now is the wide adoption of that term sheet. So we pioneered that idea in Grenada in 2014 and 15 in those debt clauses. I know Barbados did it recently uh, in its restructuring. But we need to see that widespread for small states so that when there is an event, a hurricane, a pandemic, some kind of economic shock of a certain magnitude, not a rain here and a rain there, but large shocks, we can have the facility. Because what that does is to enable our countries to recover even faster. Because you can invest in your recovery and then you resume the, the debt servicing. So in sum, that is a continuing discussion. Um, so for example, the Caribbean Development Bank has not given uh, uh, debt relief, but what it has done, it has provided a loan for member countries that need it to remain current with the CDB. So if you have a debt of say, servicing of say 20 million, CDB will provide you with a loan of 20 million so you can stay current. Now, that adds to your debt, but it does provide cash flow relief. In the case of the IMF and the World Bank, they do not provide that sort of relief. So what has happened so far is that um, some of our countries, speaking for the ECCU, four of them have gone to the IMF, like Jamaica has done, and gotten rapid uh, credit facilities um, to the tune of about 81 million US dollars to assist with financing. But I, I, I will end by saying we need to continue the conversation because what is happening is that these shocks are happening so regularly that there needs to be a protocol in place that is transparent, that is negotiated upfront, and that can be triggered and effectively implemented, implemented when and if needed in a shock. Thank you very much, Simili. Uh, let's go back to the, the audience. Uh, we got another email coming up, uh, which we'll share with you and uh, ask you gentlemen to respond. The US dollar is really on its final leg, according to this writer, and the Fed seems to have run out of options. To what extent will it will its collapse? Its collapse, that is, impact Barbados. Is that really so, uh, Governor Haynes? Can I repeat the question? No, I, I, I got a question. Okay, fine. Uh, yeah, I think what is, is critical at this point in time is really going to be related to our trade flows. Uh, yes, the U.S. currency uh, may suffer periods of depreciation, but I think at the end of the day, what one will notice is that the U.S. financial market is really a very strong financial market. And that, you know, I think we're going through a little bumpy period now in the U.S. because of their trade tensions, etc. cetera. Uh, I think those will be resolved over time and the U.S. will res resume its general dominance within the financial landscape. Clearly you have other countries which are becoming more and more important, particularly the, the Chinas of, of this world, but I don't think that the how the U.S. economy is going to go is going to lead to a, a general collapse of the dollar that will create a significant adverse impact on the Barbados economy. Right, so that's, that's, that's the Barbados viewpoint. I wanted to ask um, the, the, the governor, oh, we've got another question here. All right, let's, let's go to the email again and, uh, and see what this question is about. What are the central banks doing to allow countries to benefit from low oil prices, except Guyana, of course, I'm not sure. But anyhow, let's ask uh, the Guyana governor about this. Uh, Dr. Singh? Uh, it's, it's, it's not Dr. Singh. I think you have another person here. Anyhow, <laughs> bottom line, look, low oil prices uh, would be beneficial to oil important countries such as Guyana. Uh, we are now oil exporting also in terms of crude oil, but the impact from the lower oil price um, in terms of our profit from profit oil, that is we would have received uh, for every three shipment, we would have received one shipment um, in terms of receipts. Now what we would have seen, we received one at $55 per barrel and then the other at about $35 per barrel. So you can see about a $20 difference. Now, that is much more than the benefit we would have received from the oil import. But the bottom line is that um, 
countries need to take advantage of low oil prices. Maybe they can buy forward. Uh, we are still um, dependent on fossil fuel to a large extent. Um, over time, I mean, we would like to see our prices at some moderate level, being an oil exporting countries. But at the same time, uh, it is important in terms of uh, environmental protection and, and, and in terms of sustainable development um, is that countries need to also diversify their energy needs. Uh, we have been doing that uh, because we know that fossil fuel do have a, a finite amount. And therefore, from our end, we will try to maximize our revenues from oil. But at the same time, we will try to maximize um, our benefit from, from appropriate energy sources that are sustainable, that can provide positive uh, for the environment, and also in terms of the welfare improvement of the people in Guyana, the region, and the world over. Governor Biles, is, is it fair to say that Jamaica benefited from, from lower oil prices, or is this a, a situation in which these the change in prices really don't affect or come into effect in our particular countries because of the arrangements that we do have? No, oil prices are very important to us uh, because we are a significant oil imp uh, importing country. Uh, but over the years, we have managed to diversify away from heavy fuel oil. We have a significant uh, uh, part of our electricity um, program now being fueled by LNG. And we, of course, have a, a fairly substantial renewable uh, um, sector in the, in the energy business. Uh, last year, we paid somewhere around 55, $55 to $60 a barrel for oil. And so far this year, it's been uh, 40 or a little less sometimes and at that range uh, we can live with it if it gets above that then of course it becomes a, 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 a challenge to us um, so we looked at the possibility of doing uh, of doing either forward or taking options on oil and what I can say is this that the the, the oil market as a commodity market is is very sophisticated and nobody is sleeping at night. Everybody is up looking for opportunities uh, to make a buck. And when oil prices falls, believe you me, there are lots of people who are there uh, right at the moment getting ready to jump in and before you know what happened, the prices are up back again. So it's not a market for amateurs to play around in. Jamaica has taken uh, um, a position in, I think it was a option, and we didn't do very well with that. Um, it's a bet that you take, and you can lose that bet. And when you lose that bet, it costs you a fair amount of US dollars. Um, so not a market to play around with. Um, uh, I think it's best that you approach a problem <clears throat> in a more medium term, long term way by looking at diversifying the source of, of energy rather than playing in that commodity market. Governor Antoine, uh, you're, you're, in, you're in an environment where you're dealing with the situation of, of several countries all at the same time. Uh, where do you, where, where, what, what's the, 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 the environment that you're working with in terms of decision making regarding oil prices? So that's one of the positives of this pandemic. Um, oil prices have fallen, and as oil importing countries, um, that benefits us. Last year, we spent $1.5 billion on oil imports. Uh, this year, we will spend significantly less because of lower prices. That also helps us with our foreign exchange or foreign reserves, because as the old adage goes, $1 saved is a dollar earned. Uh, so that is working out well for us. But I agree with Governor Biles. For us, the, the focus now has to be on increasing renewables in our energy mix. In the ECCU, for example, only just under 10% of our electricity is generated from renewables, uh, hydro and solar PV. Uh, we would love to see us triple that over the next five to 10 years. Uh, and we believe that that is important not just to lower our carbon footprint, 
from the environmental perspective, which of course is extremely important in the context of the climate crisis, which is an existential threat to our region, all of us, but also in terms of lowering the cost of doing business. This, uh, this evening we're talking about, you know, saving businesses. How do we protect businesses and jobs? And we believe that that lowering of those costs, energy costs, uh, is a very important objective for helping our businesses to, 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 to stay alive okay. and to be able to. Thank you very much, sir. We're going to go to a quick break here and come back with more of the Caribbean Economic Forum. Tourism doesn't exist by itself. Tourism happens only because a whole range of other economic activities are taking place. Having tourism is to ensure that there can be growth in almost every economic sector. The small craft vendors and the small foodies on the street corner who make some of the most delicious and most delectable uh, cuisines that we could want. One of the things that is important to ensure that tourism is inclusive is that the inputs that are required for tourism must be sourced locally. Made by Jamaicans, originates in Jamaica, and is sourced in Jamaica. Tourism is working for you, is working for me, is working for all of us. Once you replace negative thoughts with positive ones, you'll start having positive results. Educate yourself. Coronavirus is in Jamaica. Employees are working from home, schools are closed, and major events are being postponed. This is because the government needs Jamaicans to help stop the spread of the virus. If the number of infected persons increases, our hospitals and health centers will be challenged. Thankfully, each of us has the power to fight the spread of coronavirus. If we stay home and avoid contact with others as much as possible, we can slow the spread and save lives. Entering public spaces makes you more likely to put others, especially the elderly and people with chronic illnesses, at risk. So this is your chance to protect yourself and others. Wash your hands regularly. Stay at least three feet away from other persons. Be a hero. Stay at home. Yo, the scammer them a call people number for it. But when you mix up with them thing then, your number can get called. Are your family? Stop the thieving. Stop the scamming. Call Mocha at 1-800-CORRUPT. Hello? Hi, Grandma. I miss you. Can you come and visit me? I miss you too, darling. But you know, this coronavirus can cause serious problems to older people like me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have to stay at home to protect myself and you too. Okay, Grandma, stay safe and remember <laughs> to wash your hands. All the time. Bye, darling. And welcome back to the Caribbean Economic Forum, the 2020 series beginning uh, this month and continuing right through to the end of the year, hosted by the Central Bank of Barbados. And we've got four governors with us this evening, not only the Cleveson Haynes, who is the governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, but also Richard Biles, the governor of the Bank of Jamaica in Kingston, Jamaica, where I am, Dr. Timothy Antoine, the governor of the Eastern Caribbean uh, Central Bank in Bastos and Kids, and uh, Dr. Gabinda Ganga, governor of the Bank of, uh, of Guyana. And I have to tell you, uh, Dr. Ganga, why I said sing. I've been in Trinidad too long. And uh, every time I see the name Ganga, I think it's Ganga Singh. So that <laughs> that's the history of that one. All right, let's uh, go to uh, another member of our audience. And this time we're going to somebody in the United States. Roshane uh, has provided us with a question. So let's hear from you. How are you doing? Welcome. I'm doing good. How are you doing? Good evening, everybody. Go right ahead with your question. All right, so this question is for, uh, I guess, the entire panel. Uh, given that the 
what we're dealing with with coronavirus right now and we're looking at in two months we'll be in the height of the the hurricane season um how are we factoring the plans that we're that we're we've made for coronavirus how are we factoring the potential effects of the hurricane season on these small island states all right that's a good question and very timely since we, as he said we're right in the hurricane season uh let's see uh, Cleverton Haynes, you want to take that since you're furthest in the Eastern Caribbean and most likely to, to feel the first wind? Yes, we, we feel the first winds. But, you know, the, the issue of uh, hurricanes is something that concerns us uh, at all times because, as you appreciate, the, the hurricanes seem to be getting stronger and stronger each year, and what they've been doing is very significant damage. You only have to recall what happened to Dominica about three three years ago. So a lot of the sort of economic strategizing that we have done uh, in recent years is related to preparing for the hurricanes. And Governor Anton mentioned the fact that as part of our uh, debt restructuring, we incorporated the, the, the hurricane clauses into our bonds such that if there is a significant uh, event for us, that we'll be able to sort of sustain payments on our, both our external and our domestic debt for a period of two years. And that would provide for us uh, significant fiscal savings to allow us to be able to rebuild our, our economy. Because as you would appreciate, the, the damage that these uh, very strong systems can do to your economy will then put you under pressure as you try to uh, rebuild that economy to get the, the funds necessary. Uh, it, it's very difficult. These, these days you get lots of commitments, uh, the time when uh, an event occurs, but what you really want is to have those funds available so that you can uh, repair your infrastructure and rebuild lives which are badly affected uh, by these uh, climatic events. So we are very conscious of that, and that is why you would see that we have incorporated the, the hurricane clauses into our, our, our debt restructuring. All right, let me ask uh, Governor Biles uh, to respond to that question. I know that you're old enough to remember Hurricane Gilbert, and you really wouldn't have, want to have anything like that happen again uh, to Jamaica or any other territory for that matter. But let's talk about it from your perspective. Well, I think we are a lot more prepared uh, today than we were for Gilbert. Uh, but nonetheless, um, Clariston is right. The hurricanes are stronger than ever. Um, and apart from trying to be lucky and dodge them, um, our usual hurricane preparedness has been put in place. Um, but it would be a serious blow if on top of the pandemic, on top of the uh, reversal in our tourism fortunes that we were to feel a serious hurricane impact. Uh, so. We do the best we can uh, with our preparation uh, and just hope that we don't get a, a very serious full hit from one of these um, storms. All right. Um, quickly, I will go to, uh, to Governor Antoine uh, in that there because uh, we're at a point where, what, three years now on from the serious impact of uh, the Hurricane Maria on Dominica and the Leeward Islands and Guilla and so on. Uh, let's let's hear your your particular perspective on this matter. The question raised. We are very very mindful of the hurricane season, which is projected to be above average. So the truth is that we got a jump start in preparation because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So a lot of the work in terms of business continuity and resilience plans by our banks, our licensees, by us as a central bank, and by our people in general. Uh, we've sort of focusing early on the things that we need to do. So we're praying, we're planning, and we're praying. Uh, that's our strategy. And our hope is that uh, we will be able to weather that particular storm. God knows we could do without one of those right now. Let's uh, go now to another question uh, from our audience. This is Delano. We've got a question for the panel. Welcome, Delano. Good evening to the governors and all of the viewership and listenership. I want to thank the governors for giving up their time to sit with the region and have this candid conversation about COVID-19 and the future. Now, I have two questions. The first is for Governor Antoine. Governor Antoine, given that some countries in the ECCU have had to amend 
their national insurance fund uh, policy to, in order to allow for the payment of unemployment benefits during this time of COVID-19. Is this something that you believe that going forward, much like Barbados and other countries in the region, should these ECCU countries now consider making unemployment benefits a permanent feature of their policy? And in addition to that, what would that mean for the sustainability and the solvency of these national insurance funds? Now, the second question I have is for all of the governors, really. Um, is it time in the region for our governments to rethink uh, our current regime of travel tax in terms of interregional taxes? And what role, if any, do you guys see the central banks playing in this process? Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you very much, Alano. Uh, Governor Antoine? So, yes, uh, we believe that the time is ripe for us to look at unemployment insurance, unemployment benefit for our social security systems. Uh, the reality is that our social security systems are the single most important safety net, social safety net that we have in this region. And the reality is that in the last few years, they have been called upon too often, far too often to our liking, uh, to deal with situations. So whether it is Irma, or Maria in 2017, or it's uh, uh, the pandemic now, these social security systems uh, are being called upon to perform. Uh, and there is no provision, as, as is the case in Barbados, as you pointed out, for unemployment benefits. So I have already suggested that once we get past this period, we do have to look seriously at including an unemployment benefit in our social security systems uh, to ensure their viability long term. Uh, very quickly on the second question, um, I think we do have to have that conversation. We know for a fact that 50%, just about 50% of, of our airfares are what we call TFCs, tax fees, taxes, fees and tax fees and charges, TFCs. And we need to have that conversation. But that's a regional conversation with our government because no single government could unilaterally change that and, in, and make any difference. If, if one country did it now, all that would happen is that they would lose revenue and there'll be no increase in traffic. So our governments would need to come together to discuss this issue and agree on a reduction to incentivize regional travel, uh, especially in this period of, of downturn. So that's a regional conversation. All right, and uh, that regional conversation may have an impact on the discussions that uh, are due to be held on Saturday where the shareholders of, of LIAT are getting together to talk about the current situation. All right, let's go to another member of the audience, and Oshana is online with a question for the panel. Oshana, welcome. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I guess my question is to Governor Wells. Um, I heard you in your introduction, you, you touched briefly on the Jamaican stock exchange. So my question is, how big a role do you think the GSE um, has in Jamaica's recovery post-COVID. All right, thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, so I had mentioned before that the stock exchange took a pretty big hit with the closure of our borders. Uh, and, you know, it, it took a big hit because it was a star performer. Uh, it means that a lot of people are invested in it, uh, particularly uh, a whole host of new, younger investors got interested in the market. Uh, maybe you are one of them. Uh, and so it was very disappointing to see that uh, the market had to take that step back. Um, the market does have a very important role to play in Jamaica's development, and it has. I mean, over the years, I would say over the last maybe six, eight years, uh, a lot, many, many companies have come to the market through the stock exchange, uh, and they have done very well. They've raised billions of dollars of capital. Uh, so there's no question that the stock exchange has a major role to play in our future development. It depends a lot on getting the economy as a whole back on track, um, and that is what our aim is, to make sure that the foundation on which uh, uh, recovery that is long-lasting, that that foundation is solid and that needs us to be very prudent uh, in our macrofiscal management. 
let's turn our attention again to the audience, uh, taking advantage of this historic conversation with central bank governors across the region. Here's an email with a question. Have we erred and imposed on social security funds to relieve a crisis resulting from nationally declared emergencies rather than use wartime methods of financing to provide basic in incomes as subsistence allowances? All right, um, let me see if I can direct this to, uh, to Governor Ganga in Georgetown. Sneeze, sniffle, fever, flu-like symptoms, or any respiratory illness, by order under the Disaster Risk Management Act, stay at home. What if they knew that you abused her? Her family? Mr. Jones. in Georgetown. Have we erred and imposed on social security funds to relieve a crisis resulting from nationally declared emergencies rather than use wartime methods of financing to provide basic incomes as subsistence allowances? Dr. Ganga? All right, we seem to have a, a problem with uh, with the audio coming from Dr. Okay, there he is. I'm, I'm back. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, Jude. When we are speaking about the livelihood of people, it doesn't matter where we are looking, if it is from a social security fund or some emergency fund with respect to some wartime, whatever. The bottom line is that we have to look at the livelihood of people. In this region, we still have a high level of poverty. When we talk about monetary, fiscal, and other type of policies, that doesn't make any sense to the people, the poor people, and those who are vulnerable. So we have to have certain measures in place to ensure that there is sustainable um, relief in terms of welfare for these people. Meaning, we should have the basic social security guarantee in terms of an income to the, to the vulnerable, to those in the informal sectors that are most affected with any situation, not just COVID, but it's an ongoing thing that we have to be very, very cognizant of. So, so while we can use all the fancy terms in terms of an accommodative monetary policy, a fiscal stance that would allow more government spending, we have to ensure that we have focused policies to ensure the minimum in terms of for people's livelihood, meaning they should have the basic needs. So we have to have an approach, which is, as I said earlier, one that would encourage for the sustainability of the, I would say here, the sustainable development goal. That is so important for us in this region because those in the informal sector are almost 30 to 40%. And, 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 and when you look and you see the kind of poverty that exists, you have to really think hard in terms of what kind of social security system you put in place or welfare program. But the welfare program we put should be one which will allow for some diversification of the economy and to ensure that these people have productive um, and decent jobs so they can also contribute towards the growth and development of, the, of their economy and the region as a whole. Here we are talking about not only building resilience uh, within the family, but building resilience that will also help for the, 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 the national economy development, which obviously will spill over to regional development. Thank you, Julian. Thank you very much, sir, and thanks for your patience getting us back on track here. This is the Caribbean Economic Forum, and uh, we are going to uh, continue our session uh, with, with Tony, another member of the audience joining us. Tony, welcome. Welcome, Tony. Oh, he just dropped out. Okay, fine. We'll be, hopefully, you'll get back in and be able to, uh, to join us. 
I want to stay with the with, with the question last pose and, and give uh, Governor Haynes an opportunity to respond to that. I know you did talk about the importance of looking after the vulnerable in terms of all the uh, all the measures and, and planning, etc. So we, here's a chance to expand for the benefit of the audience. Yes, thanks, Julian. The, the issue here really is, is twofold. Uh, it's very important for us to have a social safety net in order to protect uh, persons when they uh, encounter these things of uh, difficult situations. But fundamentally, the issue comes back to the strength of our overall macroeconomic policies, which allows us to build buffers to give us the resilience that we need in these situations. Because ultimately, our capacity to be able to fund, whether through a social safety net or through uh, economic transfers, is going to depend quite heavily on what fiscal space we have at that point in time. And sometimes what happens is that we, because we're running uh, large deficits for a prolonged period, we don't have the resources available to be able to finance the, either the social safety net or, or the increased welfare that we need uh, when we meet a challenge like this. So I think what this uh, COVID situation uh, has taught us is that we need to build buffers such that we are able to be resilient if uh, impacted by these types of events. This is the Caribbean Economic Forum with its historic gathering of, of governors of the central banks of the region. Uh, Timothy Antoine at the headquarters of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union in Bastes and Kitts. Dr. Gabinda Ganga at the Bank of Diana in Georgetown. Richard Biles at the Bank of Jamaica in Kingston, where I am, and at Cleveston Haynes, the last governor you just heard from at the bank's headquarters in Bridgetown, Barbados. And it is the Central Bank of Barbados that is playing host in this series, which is monthly, and will give you an opportunity to talk to several personalities across the region to focus on particularly the whole matter of recovery uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic, which has so affected much of this region. And uh, of course, uh, we encourage you all to get involved and to send us your questions, etc. And in fact, we know we have a new question to pose to our panel. Let's see what that question is. What role can digitizing public sector regulatory agencies play in helping to modernize and diversify our markets beyond tourism sector initiatives to make our regional export markets more competitive? I know this is a pet subject for Governor Ganga in terms of uh, technology and its impact on our region. So I'm going to give you a chance to, 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 to deal with this one first. Look, Julian, indeed, look, enhancing our technology and digitalizing transactions, they are very important to improve efficiency so that we can have increased production and productivity within our economy. But we have to be cognizant of the fact that we do have different age group. We have different people from the perspective of those who are computer literate, who are not. So we have to be very, very careful in terms of the phasing of technology, not only within our productive system, but also within our social um, um, contacts. Indeed, um, there is so much to be had from, from the digitalized um, transaction. But once again, we also have to be very careful with respect to fraud. We will find that those who have gone straight into, for example, having more digitalized payment would have encountered quite a lot of fraud. So we have to be careful so that we have this, this safety in terms of um, cybersecurity. We have to have the kind of, of, of I would say, capabilities uh, to overlook employees who are part and parcel of this digitalized world because of fraud. So yes, more technology will enhance production and productivity. We don't want to have people who will be left back. We have to bring them up. We have to train them. We have to improve their capabilities. We have to ensure that we have proper system to ensure that we don't encounter fraud. And at the same time, we have to be cognizant that we don't take away what this COVID has shown us. Although we have this virtual meeting, 
I missed having my fellow governors near to me for a hug, for a shake hand and whatever. So we have to be very careful what we are attempting to do here. Thank you, Julia. All right, Ho hopefully that situation will change in time. Uh, Governor Biles, I wanna bring you in here because I'm, I, 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 because I live here, I'm aware of the deployment of technology in the service of people, uh, whether it's from the public sector or from the private sector, for instance. Is it that COVID has really forced on us the greater use of technology? Absolutely, uh, and maybe that is the one good thing that COVID has brought to us. Uh, so issues of working from home, I think, uh, is an exciting new way to balance work life and private life and to be still very productive. Um, and even at our institution, we are experimenting with it and so far we have found it to be excellent. Uh, but the whole business of government interfacing with the public, how you apply for licenses, how you pay taxes, pay fees, uh, whatever the service that government has to provide, to be able to do that online, to do it uh, without having to get up from where you are and go somewhere else, enhances efficiency tremendously. Um, and I, I don't think we could, um, you know, anyone could argue against that. Uh, the electronic payments too, vital. I mean, it's so efficient and yes, uh, I agree with Gobin that there is a added uh, opportunity for fraud, but you have to protect against it. It's just vastly more efficient than the old way of doing stuff. Could, could I take a minute and, and talk a bit about the remittance business, which has kind of transferred from the old form of uh, going to uh, the bank and getting the cash to doing so electronically. Um, and we've seen a lot of that in Jamaica. Um, and to the credit of the remittance business, even in this pandemic period, it has stood up strongly. And indeed, we haven't seen a reduction in remittances to Jamaica. We have seen a small increase. And I would say that that is, uh, has to do a bit with the technology that is being used now to be able to transfer money so much more easily rather than physically going to a destination to pick it up. So here again is a real life example of how technology can positively impact uh, ourselves. Thank you very much, Governor Biles. Uh, I know that uh, in one, of the, one of the elements that um, that I'm sure Clevis and Haynes would want to talk about uh, because we'd had, a, we, we'd had a conversation before is the m matter of the automatic clearinghouse, uh, which certainly would speed up the communication between say the central bank and the various banks across uh, the markets there in Barbados. Uh, Governor Haynes? Yes, uh, Julia. The, the whole issue of payments, as my colleagues mentioned, is very important for us as, as we go forward. Uh, it's, very, it's going to be critical as we move away from traditional use of cash, use of checks, to be able to have electronic payments. And what we see in Barbados is that we are trying to modernize our, our ACH, uh, to uh, have new players in, in the market come on stream to be able to deliver uh, financial services. Because financial services represent a critical element of how we can improve uh, efficiency within the economy. Uh, as Governor Wells just said, for too long we've had uh, systems that were somewhat archaic. We have to go stand in line to make payments. Uh, this loses time, efficiency, productivity. And therefore, if we can use the payment system to be able to reduce the amount of time that persons spend uh, standing in lines to make payments, then I think we are going to be able to enhance productivity and ultimately to enhance our competitiveness as we, we go forward. Uh, one of the uh, critiques of the Barbados economy in recent years has been doing business, that we're not uh, set up really to do business efficiently. And I think that the whole question of the payment system is going to be a critical part of how we enhance our ability uh, to do business in a, in a modern world. I think the matter of technology does open up a, a discussion as well about blockchain. And I want to toss this to Governor Antoine uh, in, in Bastère. 
uh, are you operating a blockchain uh, environment in, 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 a, in a sandbox uh, and testing the systems? What's the situation there? So thanks, Julian. There is no investment that can make this region internationally competitive that is more compelling than digital transformation. And so my colleagues have spoken to the issue of payments. And what we see, if you look at the global economy, it is going digital. Uh, by 2025, at least half of the global economy will be digitized. So if we're going to have any fighting chance of survival, we have to innovate. As I put it, our survival must be the driver of innovation. So at the ECCB, what we've done is to, as part of advancing that process of digitizing our economies and societies, is to move forward with a project to digitize the EC dollar. And we will use blockchain to do that. We are at an advanced stage now of, of pre preparing to launch, and um, we expect to launch that um, not in a few weeks' time. The reality is that payments are too slow, they are too expensive, as has been said, and we believe that we could do better. And we secure. And now that's where we believe the central bank has a role to play. And interestingly enough, um, there are at least 70, 70 central banks now actively working on digital currency uh, pilots of projects. Uh, I know Bahamas has also uh, moved forward with that, and uh, we, will, we will keep you informed as we go along. All right. Well, it would believe how much time has gone so far, and just enough time for me to do a round uh, uh, Robin, so to speak, of the governors. Uh, I want all of you to give a message to the audience across this Caribbean and beyond the beyond our region, for for that matter. Is there Matt, is there a message of hope that you can give to people who are looking at the at, at the back end of of this this pandemic, etc., and are desperately hoping that they would see some improvement? And based on your own knowledge and your own projections, etc. What's, what's, the, what's the parting shot you can give to people here? Let me start with Richard Biles in Kingston, Jamaica. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, Jamaica has gone through in the last 45 years at least two other uh, critical economic uh, recessions. In 1975, 76, with the oil price that shot through the roof, uh, it took us nearly 14 years to get back to that level of GDP. Uh, so up to 1989, we had just achieved what we had done in 1975. Uh, and then again in 2007, 8 with the financial crisis emanated in the U.S., it took us nearly 11 years to 2018 before we got back to the 2007 level. So those kind of U-shaped uh, uh, recessions are very difficult for the people of the Caribbean uh, and for Jamaica. Because we entered this situation much stronger in terms of our fiscal discipline, our exchange reserves, uh, the strength of our banking system, we don't expect to have a, a U-shaped recovery, but more a kind of V-shaped recovery. So I expect that as soon as we can get the tourism business up and going again, we'll be back to where we were uh, last year. Thank you very much, Governor Biles. Uh, I'm forcing all the other governors to be very, very tight. Uh, let's go to uh, Dr. Ganga in Georgetown. You've got about 30 seconds, if not less. <laughs> Julian, thanks. Look, lots of hope. We are each other's keeper. We have a regional brotherhood. We are all Caribbean people. We have resilience. We know how to address our challenges. All that we have to stick close to each other. Indeed, individually, nationally, we will look inward. But inward will also provide us with an impetus so we can all share in terms of this spillover effect positively to the rest of the region. This is going to... Thank you. This is thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you. I, I, have, I have to take it right there because I'm being told by my producer that my time is running out. I have just enough time in which to thank you, uh, governors, for joining us in this historic uh, panel and discussion across the region and to our audience wherever you are as well. Let me invite you to come to the next uh, production, which is June, July the 28th.
when we look at the tourism sector. Again, thank you very much. And let's go now with a very special celebration by the entertainers of the Caribbean. Love will always see us through. This is 